Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is a hypothesis and a theory. See what the difference is between the two. A hypothesis is a possible explanation for a given observation. So if you make an observation and you try and explain it, that's going to be a hypothesis. However, it has to be testable. That's why we do experimentation in science, and you can have more than one. Now, when we test them in these experiments, we're seeing whether or not our explanation holds up to further observations. If these hypotheses survive all of this testing and they outlast their competing ones, then it becomes what we call a theory. And theories are well tested and widely accepted explanations for observable facts. So a hypothesis starts off with a simple, testable explanation for what we see. And if we test it and it survives, then ultimately it will be accepted and become a theory. Now one thing you'll hear a lot about in science is what we call the scientific method. And we're kind of taught that a scientific method is a series of steps that we take to do science. But if you notice down here, we see that it's not exactly a simple series. We always want to basically start with an observation. When you have the observation, it's going to prompt you to ask a question. And when you ask a question, then you come up with a solution, which is your hypothesis. Now your hypothesis is going to lead you into what we call prediction. What do you think is going to happen? Based on your explanation, what would we expect to see? We'll experiment with it, we gather more data, we analyze the data, and then we have to evaluate our hypothesis. If it's wrong, we come back. If it's right, then we continue. We'll ask further questions, we'll make further observations, and the whole cycle continues. So the scientific method is more of a guide system. Make sure that we're doing it the right way. It's not a simple series of steps. Okay. So when we're talking about Earth science, we're talking about studying this little happy guy right here, the Earth. Okay? As we study the Earth, we realize that the Earth is made up of several different things. There's the air, and that study is called meteorology. There's water, which is primarily oceanography, but we can also call it hydrology. We have a study of the land and geology, and study of life, which is biology. When we're studying the Earth, and we're studying all these different pieces and parts and how they interact with each other, that's why we call it a system science. In Earth science, we also look in astronomy and we look out into the universe so that we can see how we fit into the universe. So it's kind of the study of the Earth and its components, but also how the Earth fits into the universe as well. So one of the simple questions you get asked all the time is, how did the Earth form? And we currently believe in the nebular hypothesis, the nebular theory. And what that means is that a long time ago, four and a half billion years ago, there was a nebula in space. And that's basically a cloud of dust and gases, primarily hydrogen and helium and some of the heavier elements. And what we noticed is, is that, that nebula that was out there started to rotate. So we started to see a little bit of rotation. It collapsed in upon itself. And as it did so, we started seeing a lot of mass collect in the center, and that's where we formed our sun. But we also had this disk of residual matter that was cooling as well. And as it cooled, it allowed it to form rocks and to form solid substances. Now those solid substances down here started to collide with one another and form larger substances and ultimately those collisions cleared the pathway for our planets and the other objects of our solar system. And we'll talk more about the solar system a little bit later on. Now as the Earth cooled, what we noticed is it formed these different layers and we can kind of see them here in the picture. What we notice is that the heavier elements, like your iron and your nickel and things of that nature, they settled in to form this inner core here. And as we move outward from the inner core, we notice that the materials tend to be a little bit lighter in nature. So density had a play into forming these different layers of the Earth. And we'll study these different layers as the course continues. So that's it for our video on this lesson. Now you have a worksheet to complete for the lesson, and then go through the lesson while you're doing the worksheet and take a quiz on it, and then we'll move on. So good luck, enjoy the lesson, and we'll see you in the next video. So let's start off by taking a look at the Earth. Here's a picture of the Earth from space, and what I want you to notice is that it's totally uniform, everything on the Earth is the same, right? Absolutely not. If we take a look at here, we start seeing some differences. We start noticing that over here, we see some water. Over here, we're gonna see some clouds. We see some ice up here. We see some barren land over there. We see some green land in here. So we can see that there's a bunch of different things on the Earth. And because of that, we have to realize that Earth isn't going to be the study of one thing. It's not just the study of rocks, because we're seeing other things there. All right, so now let's talk about Earth being a system science. Because it's a system, that means there's various pieces and parts that are going to be interacting. 
we talk about these different parts as being the spheres found on the earth and the first one is the lithosphere and that's going to be the solid part of the earth and that's like your rocks and your dirt things of that nature we have the liquid part or the water part i should say and this is going to be water found on under and over the surface of the earth so that'll be like our water and our ice it'll be the oceans rivers lakes streams underground springs things of that nature all make up the hydrosphere we have the atmosphere which is the gases that surround the earth so basically that would be like our air and then finally we have the biosphere and that's all the living things on earth now we can have life in the atmosphere we can have life in the hydrosphere and we can have life upon the lithosphere and sometimes in like worms and things digging through dirt so life kind of permeates through all of these now the last thing this lesson is going to talk to you about is a little bit about plate tectonics and plate tectonics is important to earth science because it's a unifying theory what that means is it took a whole bunch of different ideas and concepts and blended them together and it's also relatively recent only about 100 years old or so so when we're talking about plate tectonics, what we're talking about how the Earth's crust is going to be made of several plates and they move around and interact and things of that nature. And we'll talk more about plate tectonics a little bit later on in this term. But it is one of the first and foremost unifying theories of Earth science. Okay, so that's it for the introductory video. Good luck with the lesson. Don't forget to complete your worksheet and we'll see you in the next video. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the global grid and what that is. And what the global grid allows us to do is it allows us to find any place on Earth and define that place and provide the location for it so that every place on the Earth is going to be unique. And in order to do this, because the surface of the Earth is going to be two-dimensional per se, we have to have two different things that we'll use. And those two things are going to be latitude and longitude. Now, this middle picture here kind of shows us the total global grid that we have, but we're going to start over here and we're going to talk about latitude first. Now, latitude are going to be these lines here that run parallel with the equator. And what they do is they measure how far north or south from the equator we want to go. So it gives us the direction of north and south. Now, one way to remember these ones, we said that these are our lines of latitude, and those are the ones that lie flat. Okay, they lay flat with the equator. Now, we said we need two things. So the other one we need are going to be longitude lines. Now, this one over here is our longitude line, and all of our lines are going to be the same length. They're all the same length. They're all long, just like each other. They go from the North Pole to the South Pole, and we have a start in here. This is called our prime meridian here. And what longitude measures is how far east or how far west it's going to be from this line here. Now, because there's 360 degrees on the opposite side at 180 degrees, we kind of have 180 degrees east and 180 degrees west, and we call that the international date line. So it has its own unique name. So zero degrees in latitude is going to be our equator, and latitude is going to measure how far north or how far south and we use longitude from the prime meridian to determine how far east or west we are. So if I know from a point of zero, zero, I can measure how many degrees north, how many degrees east, and I can find that position there. And that's why we call this a global grid, is it gives us the ability to map out or to specifically plot any point on the Earth. Now, Maps are great, they help us a lot. They help us with navigation to find things, to describe things, to show what things look like on the Earth. The biggest issue though is if we go from a round spherical object to a flat object, we have problems. Try this at home sometime. Peel an orange and then try and lay the orange peels together flat in a usable shape so that you can actually see how it would look like. And that's kind of what we're doing with maps. The problem is when we take something from this round shape over here and make it into a flat shape like the map we see here, we end up with what we call distortion. So things are going to look a little bit different, a little out of place. Okay, one of the first map projections that was out was the Mercator projection, and it's still used an awful lot today. What makes the Mercator projection useful is we talked about this global grid, and we have our lines of latitude that are here. And notice that they're parallel. They measure how far north or how far south something is. We also have these lines of longitude, and our lines of longitude in the Mercator projection are also parallel, and they're going to measure how far east or how far west something is. Now, in a Mercator projection, 
our lines of latitude are perpendicular to our lines of longitude. So you'll see that we have these nice, even little corners everywhere, and that makes it really easy to find things and use the global grid to get there. The problem is, is the further you get from the equator, we have this distortion. So you see things like Greenland here, and look how big Antarctica is here. Those are just distorted, they're blown out of proportion size-wise, and they're made to look a lot bigger. So that's where our distortion is, is greater at the poles. One way to try and correct that distortion is to use what we call a Robinson projection. Now in a Robinson projection, take a look here and notice that our lines of latitude are still going to be parallel with each other. But notice the lines of longitude. We have our prime meridian here, but the rest of the lines of longitude all have this little bow. And I'm going to draw this one here, and we'll notice a bigger bow as we go a little bit further away from it. So instead of it being perfectly perpendicular, we have these little bows to the line of longitude, and that reduces a little bit of the distortion that you noticed up here at the poles. Another common type of projection is a conic projection. And a conic projection is going to be if we took a cone of paper, and here you can see where its shape is, and it's just laid over the globe, and then we project the image onto the paper that way. And what you notice is where it's contacting the globe, so we're going to see that line right about through here is where it's going to be super accurate. The further we get from that point of contact is where we're going to see more distortion. Okay, so we'll see kind of a variation and kind of a change that way. These are going to be really good if we want something in this part right here. So if you wanted to make a navigation in that part, a conic projection would give you an accurate representation of what it looks like. Now the mnemonic projection is if we were to take a piece of paper and just set it on one point on the earth and then project the images out. And that's what it's kind of showing you here is we could show this projection outwards. Now this is going to give us a really good representation around where that was touching. These are used a lot in navigation because it provides us with an accurate representation of that area and we can use that to determine the distances from one place to another which is really good. So that's one of the things I want you to see is that we have these different projections. They all kind of do something a little bit differently. They have their benefits. The further you get from that point of contact is where we're going to see the most distortion. So that's where those maps become a little less useful. But right in this area, it's good. If you were trying to do something out here, you'd probably want to either move the piece of paper, draw another map for that area, or possibly use a different type of map. Okay, so a different kind of map that we're going to talk about are these topographic maps. And a topographic map is kind of neat because it takes that two-dimensional map that we've been talking about, but it adds that third dimension, that dimension of elevation. So if we take a look down here, we can actually see that we have a land form. And I kind of have a nice little picture here so you can kind of see what it is. We can draw that on a map it would look basically just simple. There's nothing there. There's no water or anything like that. It could be just a flat section of the map, and it would just look like that. With topographic, what it does is we add these contour lines in. And these contour lines give us a clue on elevation, how high something is above the surface of the oceans. Okay, And we'll notice that here in here we have a little bit of an incline, and we can see we go from 280 to 290 to 300 here. Then we have more over here, 310, 320, 330, and it all kind of lines up with the picture. But then we have this little depression here, and we can see that's marked on our map this way. So topographic maps are really nice because they'll give us an idea of elevational changes. That's what we would use them for. Now the final kind of map we're going to talk about is what we call a geologic map. And a geologic map is important if we want to know what kind of rocks are showing or when those rocks are dated back to and things of that nature. So it gives us geologic information. And these are only going to be valuable if we have the key. So if we take a look over here at our example, what we'll notice is that we have these quaternary sediments are going to be in yellow, and you can see where we would find those. So if I was looking for something that was going to be in a tertiary fossil, then I would want to look for a tertiary sedimentary rocks and these light greens, and I might want to spend a lot of time in this area over here, but it would be pointless for me to be in this area over here where it just wasn't the right time frame. So a geologic map gives us an idea of the rocks, the outcropping of the rocks that's showing. So it can give us a clue as to what we're looking at in that area. Okay, the last topic of this lesson is going to be on satellites and technology and how they have helped us get a better representation of the Earth, a better view of the Earth per se. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of different kinds of satellites, and you can go through in the lesson and read what those are. 
but basically it just gives us more observations, more data, and we're able to get a better picture, or create a better model of the Earth from these. All right, well, that's it for this video. As always, good luck on the lesson, and we'll see you in the next video. So to begin this, we need to talk about what is a system. And a system, quite simply, is going to be a bunch of interacting pieces and parts that all work together to form something. So that something in Earth science is going to be the Earth here. And we talked about our four basic spheres. We have the lithosphere, which is the solid part, the hydrosphere, which is the water, the atmosphere, which is the gases, and the biosphere, which is the life. And you can see all the interactions that these things have towards the Earth. So that's why we say that Earth science is a system science, because we have all these different pieces and parts that are interacting with each other. And that's how we have to study the class. Now, one of the things we'll talk about in the lesson real briefly is the energy for the Earth. How does the system of the Earth get its energy to keep going? The bulk of the energy is going to come from the sun. And that's going to provide us with energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. So light, UV waves, ultraviolet rays, things of that nature is what we're talking about from the sun. And those are going to feed most of the things that we'll see on the surface. So life via photosynthesis gets it. Weather is going to be impacted greatly by the energy that comes from the sun. That drives the water cycle, which is very important in the erosional processing on the planet. So those things that kind of are on the surface we see. The energy for the inside activities is going to come from the core of the Earth. This is where we have this molten ball of iron that's kind of there. There's nuclear reactions and a lot of heat generated there. And that's what drives our tectonic plates and it creates our volcanism. So we have some building up of mountains and things of that nature. So we'll see these two primary energy sources and we'll talk a little bit about them and their influences and what they do throughout this entire class. One of the things we'll talk about in this class and a little bit in this lesson is human impacts and basically how the human species is impacting the earth. We're changing some of these different pieces and parts. We have climate change because of carbon emissions that are changing the atmosphere, and that in turn is affecting these other spheres. So we're changing the whole system that way. We also have pollution. We have mining. We have all kinds of different things that we're able to do to the planet, and sometimes we don't see the long-term effects of what we're doing. So in this class, we're going to bring up these periodically where we'll show you how human impact is changing the system. We're changing the Earth as it goes on. Tied into human impacts is we have this whole idea of environmental problems. And there's two primary problems that we'll be bringing up periodically. Some of them are man-made, which you can kind of see in here is this smog, okay, or pollution that we're going to be seeing, things of that nature. And those are things that man has done that has created the problem. But the other one is the effect that these natural disasters and natural events have on our populations. And that I kind of wanted to show you down here. So you can see that we are contributing to problems, we're making problems, we're bringing new things in, but also some of the old natural disasters that have always happened because we have larger populations and we're living elsewhere, it impacts our human population a little bit more, and those are what we'll call additional environmental problems. Okay, so that's it for this video. As always, good luck with the lesson, and we'll see you in the next video.